was thank you all so much for coming to Bible study tonight. We are going to begin our lesson, but before we do, uh, just a few announcements. This week is Holy Week. That means we have a good Friday service. Friday service starts at 7 p.m. We're asking that you promptly be here because we're starting on time and you don't want to miss any of this. So this Friday at 7 p.m., Good Friday service is starting. Uh, it will be reminiscent of our Christmas cantata. Uh, you'll see what the, the lighting is like. It'll be somber and dark, candles. Uh, we're wearing black. You don't have to, uh, but if you choose to, come in black, and it will be a worship experience, uh, unlike anything we've done on a Good Friday service. So I'd encourage you to come be with us on that Good Friday. Also, on Sunday morning, we have a community sunrise service. That sunrise service will be held at Archaea Baptist Church at 6.30 a.m. You heard me right, 6.30 a.m. That's why it's sunrise. Uh, our choir will be singing, I'll be preaching, and then we will have breakfast that will be served at Archaea after that worship service. And then we're coming back to Rise and Star at 10 a.m. for our resurrection service here at the Star. So again, Good Friday service at 7 p.m., Sunday morning at 6.30 sunrise at Archaea, and then 10 a.m. here at Rising Star. In, any questions at all? We said Good Friday, you can dress in black if you choose. Well, listen, for me, every Friday's black, every Thursday's black, every Wednesday's black, every Tuesday's black, every, no matter what day you choose, it's black for me. Every time I look in the mirror, it's always black, so... But, but the reason I mentioned the color is because the choir is going to be in black. Um, clergy will be in black. So when you come, just so that you know, you mean, well, I would have wore black. It's not mandatory, not required. Um, it's simply helping to set the mood for the occasion. Because leading up to Resurrection Sunday, we need to know why we do what we do. That Resurrection, Easter, it means something. But the truth of the matter is, many folk don't really know what it means. And so this gives us an opportunity to teach, to lay a foundation, and to understand our faith in a genuine, real, and sincere way. And so Good Friday service is our opportunity to remember, to reflect, to reverence, and to worship the sacrifice that Jesus gave on Calvary. That's what Good Friday is about. That's what it's about. And we've got to be intentional about that. And so that's why for the last few weeks, the Bible studies, and the Sunday sermons, all of this has been leading us up to this moment. Everything is building brick upon brick, brick upon brick, laying the foundation, providing a spiritual infrastructure that when we do come on Easter or Resurrection Sunday and we say he got up, you, you know what you're shouting about. Amen? Amen. That you can worship God according to knowledge. Not just making noise, being one of the number, being a parrot and repeat what somebody said. But we've been in the book together. We've studied together. We prayed together. And not only do we know that this is real, but we know it's real in us. Amen? And so when it's real to you on a personal level, nobody has to pump you or pry you. Nobody has to tell you, now get up and praise the Lord. Give God glory. Give him praise. Now come on, church. No, no. Because you've already been prepared. You've already been meditating. You've already been taught. And so when you get to that moment, nobody got to beg you to chill. No, no. No. Let me tell you what praise is. The best definition I've ever heard for praise is this. Praise is the expression of a grateful heart that realizes how good God has been. Praise is the expression of a grateful heart that realizes how good God has been. And the only way you can know how good God has been by way of salvation, if you understand the depth of the sacrifice of Calvary, how, how can you be thankful for something, be grateful for something, but you don't know what it cost? You don't know what they went through to achieve it. See, we receive salvation, and there's a saying that salvation is free, and it is, but discipleship comes at a cost. And when you just get something, but you're never reminded of the cost of it, 
you don't have the appreciation for it that you should. Are y'all hearing me? And when we preach and teach and sing and talk about everything else, but we omit the cost of Calvary, that God gave his only begotten son, the sacrifice of the sinless son of God for our sinless selves. The only worthy one died for the unworthy. The sinless died for sinners. Perfect died for imperfection. Holy died for hellish. And when we don't understand that, realize that, and meditate on it, think about it, we got to remember, we got to reflect, we have to reverence, and then that will lead us into worship. That's why we talk about it. That's why we talk about it. Um, there's an old Shirley Caesar song. I'm going to pray in a minute, but I'm going to tell you this story. Old Shirley Caesar song. And Shirley Caesar has some of the greatest gospel songs ever, ever written or sang. And she's talking in the song. She's leading up to the chorus. And she tells the story of this mother who had these horrific scars on her hands and on her face. Hands and her face had these horrific scars, burns all over. Her daughter, only child, was, was beautiful. Just a gorgeous little girl. And as she was growing up, she knew she was cute. And as she began to blossom into young womanhood, the prettier she got, the more she despised how her mother looked. As a matter of fact, she grew rather ashamed of her mother's appearance. When her mama would take her to school and drop her off, they would say, is that your mama? She would say no. She would deny her own mother because she was ashamed. She looked down. She despised her mother's appearance. So one day, mother's bringing the girl to school. She's in high school at this point. She says, uh, mama, just drop me off at the corner. I'll walk the rest of the way because she don't want anybody to see her riding in a car with her mother. Her mother does it. She got a sense of what was going on with the girl, but she wasn't quite sure. She let her out the car, and just so happened, one of her little friends came by, and she said, is that your mama? She said, girl, no, that ain't my mama. See, that's how I made it. And she walked on to school. She didn't know her mother overheard her. Her mother sat there, and she cried for an hour right there on the side of the road. She came back at the end of school to pick her daughter up. Her daughter meets her at the corner where she told her to meet her so nobody else would see her. The daughter gets in the car with her, and they start driving home. When they drove home, there was this silence. It was just this eerie silence. And it's the first time her and her mother have driven home from school, and her mother was just quiet. Every day her mother always asked her, baby, how was your day? What did you learn? Did you make any friends? She would always chat and ask her how she was doing, loved on her. But this day, the mama didn't say anything. She was just quiet. The daughter knew something was wrong, but she couldn't figure it out. The whole drive from the school to the house, they pull in the driveway. The mother stops, puts the car in park, and she turns off the engine. That was just kind of a nervous anxiety. That was in the air. The girl opened the door to get out, and her mama said, wait, we need to have a talk. She said, I know what you've been doing. You've been having me drop you on the corner so your schoolmates don't see me pull up to the school and drop you off because you're ashamed of how I look. These scars and burn marks on my face and on my hands. I know what you've been doing. She said, no, mama, that's not why. She said, no, 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 no. I heard what you said to your little friend when she came around the corner. And the girl dropped her head in shame. She said, but mama, you just don't look good. And I just can't, I just can't let folk know that you my mama. She said, baby, you see my scars, but I never told you how I got them. When, when you were born, when you were born, you know this, your daddy wasn't around. And I raised you the best I could. And, and one day, one day, 
Me trying to be a good mother and trying to make sure that your daddy's people stayed in your life, they would come by and they would, they would want to keep you for the weekend. I didn't feel good about it because I didn't agree with how they lived their life, but I wanted you to know your daddy's people, and so um, I would let them. And they would have these parties, and they would just get lit, and they would have all these folk in the house, and I would always just drive by just to make sure you would be all right. And one weekend, it was your daddy's side of the family's weekend to have you. I was asleep. It was 12 midnight, and the Holy Spirit woke me up. I got up, I put on my clothes and my shoes, and I rushed across town to that house. Baby, when I got to that house, everybody's on the front lawn, and the house is on fire, engulfed with flames. The fire department and the truck was there, but there was no water running because the house was engulfed with flames. And I'm looking and I'm searching all over the grass. I'm asking everybody, where is my baby? The first three or four people didn't say anything. And I asked the fireman, I said, where is my baby? He said, ma'am, I'm sorry to tell you, but the baby is in the house. The house got engulfed with flames so quick, we can't send anybody. We got to let it burn down. Then we'll put it out. Then we'll go in and we'll recover the body. It's too dangerous to try to rescue the baby. I ran in the house. They tried to hold me, but I wouldn't let them. I ran in the house. I went to the room where I knew you were, and you were right there, fire all around you, but God wouldn't let one flame touch your body. I picked you up. I put you in my bosom. And I ran out the house. I made sure fire didn't touch you, but it burned my face off. And it burned my hands. But it didn't send your hair on your head. I never told you why I look the way I look, because I never want you to feel bad. Because of what you said, I think you need to know. This child never knew the sacrifice her mother Gave so she could have the life she had. She, she thought she was just cute by accident. But the price her mother paid for her to enjoy what she enjoyed, to live the life that she lived, she never knew it. And I dare say there's a parallel there between Resurrection Sunday, Good Friday, the sacrifice that Jesus gave for us because we handle this thing called grace so lightly. We handle this thing called grace as if it's a cheap thing, as if you can pick it up at any department store, as if Dollar General or Family Dollar or Walmart can stock it. But this thing called grace, you can't write a check for it and you sure can't charge it. This thing called grace that we enjoy. The privilege that when we mess up and when we miss the mark. First John 1 and 9 says, I can confess my sins and God is faithful and just to forgive me my sins and cleanse me from all unrighteousness. And we can take such, such a thing as precious as grace and willfully walk outside the will of God. Why? Because I can be forgiven not recognizing what it costs God to make it so. That's why we slow down. That's why we emphasize. That's why we teach, and that's why we're going to teach and talk about Holy Week and lay the foundation. Not only the resurrection on Sunday morning, Easter, because Easter is not about eggs and bunny rabbits. We do know that, right? Not about bunny rabbits and eggs and all that type stuff. That's the stuff that we do when we placate the kids, and that's fine in its proper place. But as mature believers, as disciples of the Lord Jesus, you can't truly celebrate the resurrection unless you understand the sacrifice of Good Friday in Calvary. Listen. The good news ain't good news. The good news is Easter, Resurrection Sunday. The good news ain't good news if you don't know the bad news. It's the bad news that makes the good news good news. Baby, church folk don't even know when to shout. <laughs> and 
And so um, I, I enjoy, I enjoy this season. I do. I enjoy it. Let me tell you what this is for us. Resurrection Sunday is the super, it's our Super Bowl. <laughs> That's our Super Bowl. That's our Super Bowl. The, the world, and, and the world has enough sense. When it has something that's good, it'll build it up. It'll draw it out. It'll market it right, won't it? Right now it's March Madness. It's the build up to the Final Four and the National Championship. And they milk it for all it's worth. When it comes Super Bowl time, they don't just play the Super Bowl. They got something called the playoffs. And they milk it for all it's worth. And for us, Resurrection Sunday is our Super Bowl. And we don't just rush to it, no. Listen, grown married folk know foreplay helps. <laughs> you don't just go to the climax. You got to build into that thing. Grown, thank you. Grown married folk. Amen. Amen. Single folk don't know what I'm talking about. <laughs> the appetizer before the entree. Let the church say amen. 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 So listen. Okay. D, you up there? Amen. 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 Every time I turn around, blessings. Amen. Appreciate the assist. All right. <laughs> it's all good. It's all good. So uh, we, we, we are go we're going to pray. We're going to get into our lesson. Uh, last week we left off on number two of our final four things out of Matthew chapter 16, verse 21. We'll go through those four and then do the best we can to get through Holy Week and Palm Sunday. My wife asked me, were we going to get through it all? I don't lie to my wife, so I told her no. <laughs> but we will do our best. Uh, let us bow our heads for prayer. Father, we thank you for allowing us to gather here today. We thank you for this assembly and for all those that have come. Lord, we pray now that you would grant us the grace that we need to teach your word and handle it with integrity, with wisdom and insight. And give us receptive hearts that we might be able to receive everything that you desire to show us by your spirit. God, that the words of our mouth and the meditations of our heart, let it be acceptable in your sight. You are our strength and our redeemer. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. So let's jump to it. Let's go to Matthew chapter 16, and we will pick up where we left off briefly. Um, we will do some Bible study tonight in regards to the Holy Week, the Holy Week. And so um, we've already covered the significance of why we're going to uh, learn about Holy Week, why I'm teaching Holy Week, the emphasis of it. Again, it's to help us remember, reflect, reverence, and worship the sacrifice of Christ. We're going to say that together. Help us say remember, remember. reflect, remember. reverence, remember. and worship. Amen. 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 The cost is too great for us to just run by it as if it's a stop sign we did not see. The cost is too great for us to ignore it and act like it's a little thing that happened. Uh, but what happens on Friday, the sacrifice of Christ, understand has never happened in all of human history and will never happen again. What happened on that Friday has affected all of our eternity. Matthew 16, verse 21, if you have it, say amen. amen. From that time, Jesus began to show his disciples that he must go to Jerusalem, that's number one, and suffer many things from the elders and chief priests and scribes, that's number two, and be killed, that's number three, and be raised up on the third day, that's number four. That is the final four. These are the four things that Jesus declared must be done. This would conclude his earthly assignment. When he does this, it's a wrap. We covered last week the first two. Uh, the first one, Jesus said, I must go to Jerusalem. On Sunday morning, I preached from the Gospel of John, what's called the triumphant entry into Jerusalem, when Jesus, on the back of a donkey that had never been written, rode on, the road, rode on that donkey on the road that leads from Bethany and Bethpage into the city of Jerusalem. 
as he is riding, the people are praising. They are shouting. They shout things like, Hosanna, Hosanna. Blessed be he that cometh in the name of the Lord. Blessed be thou son of David. They cheer him. They extol him. They are excited because now they believe their Messiah had come. And when they enter into the city, when Jesus goes into the city, rather, his first stop is to go by the temple. His first stop is to go by the temple. Um, I'm going to put this poster up here. Um, it's a poster. It, it gives us um, the highlights of the last week of the earthly life of Jesus. Uh, it tells us of Sunday, which is called Palm Sunday, when he went into the temple and how Sunday bleeds into Monday. Now, this particular calendar of events, depending on which calendar you look at, it varies, it varies, it varies. Slight variations, not major variations, but slight variations. Um, Mark says it a little bit different. Mark says when he goes into the temple, when he gets into Jerusalem, he goes right into the temple. Um, Matthew says he goes into Jerusalem, then he goes back out, and then he goes back into the temple. But nonetheless, he goes into the temple. Uh, when he goes into the temple, he cleanses the temple. We want to emphasize what Jesus did when he went into the temple. I touched on it a little bit on Sunday. Didn't mean to, just got happy, Q. Just got the feeling good to me. And sometimes, just get the feeling, when it feel good, it just feel good. Um, but when Jesus goes into the temple, after he enters in Jerusalem, it's for a specific purpose. It was not by accident. It was strategic. It was pur purposeful and intentional. I want to take a moment to just unpack and excavate how Jesus went into the temple, the what of what he did and the why of what he did. Can we do that? All right, turn with me to the book of Matthew again. And this time we're in Matthew chapter 20. Hmm. Matthew chapter 21. Matthew chapter 21. And we'll read this account in two separate gospels. Matthew chapter 21. We'll start at verse 12. When you have it, say amen. And Jesus entered the temple and drove out all those who were buying and selling in the temple and overturned the tables of the money changes and the seats of those who were selling doves. And he said to them, it is written, my house shall be called of all a house of prayer, but you've made it a robber's den. And the blind and the lame came to him in the temple and he healed them. So before I excavate this too much, I've got a few questions to ask the audience. Uh, number one, when Jesus goes into the temple and he turns over the tables of the money changes, I need for you, and be honest, raise your hand if you don't know what a money changer is. Come on, tell the truth and shame the devil. You don't know what a money changer is. So everybody know what a money changer is. Thank you. Kiki, I love you. I love you. Okay. So when Jesus goes into the, into the temple, he goes to right where they have a system of exchange in place. Remember, Jerusalem is the capital city for the Jewish people. And people come from all over, not just the region, but they come from near and far, far and wide. They, they come as far as Ethiopia to come to Jerusalem and worship. And the people who come from other countries have other currency. Just as if you were to take your dollars and cents, you would take these American greenbacks, these old presidents that are on our money, and if you were to go just over to Mexico, understand, you would think your money could spend everywhere, but it don't. It, it may spend in Mexico, but it don't spend everywhere. My, my wife and I went on a short-term mission trip to Kenya, what, about five, six years ago? I told the story before. Forgive me if you've heard it. Don't mean to bore you, but for those who don't uh, know this story, I think you might enjoy it. We get, we get to Kenya, and, and me being who I am, 
um, I procrastinated in going to the uh, currency exchange office. I made my mind up, well, I just, when I get to Kenya, I'll go and get the money changed out. And so we get there, it's late. We fly into Nairobi. We get to Nairobi, they take us straight to what they call the mission house. We get a few hours sleep, barely a good nap. Got to get up early in the morning because we got a ride from Nairobi to a little town called Nakuru. It's like five or six hours deep down on rocky roads. You think we got potholes. I mean, it's a mess. It's like a roller coaster for five or six hours. Halfway there, we stop at a rest stop. We get off the van. They've got an area where you can buy food, you can buy drink, you can buy refreshments. They have another area. That's where they have their facilities where you go to the restroom. Now, their facilities at this place are different from what we're used to. As we are walking down this long, wide hallway, and my wife has told me she has to go to the restroom. And so we're walking together because I got to go too. She sees an elderly African woman with a towel, not a towel, a table in front of her, and she has tissue. And she is selling tissue and pieces of tissue. And my wife looks at me and she says, why is this lady selling tissue in front of the restroom? I said, sweetie, evidently they don't give it to you. So we walk up there. I'm speaking English. She's speaking Swahili. And my wife has to go to the restroom, but she needs some tissue. And so this lady is telling me how much the tissue costs. Here's the problem. All I have is U.S. currency. Yeah. But Rodney started and sent me over there broke. Oh, no, we're going to missionaries to bless some folks. I pull out, what, what you need? She looks at my money and said, mm-mm. She refuses all of it. I've got U.S. currency, greenbacks. Listen, I got Thomas Jefferson. I got Benjamin Franklin. I left George Washington at the house. She looks at me and she says, no, shillings. Shillings. Yeah, shillings. And so I'm talking to her. I'm trying to, yeah, I, I've got, take, take this Andrew Jackson. No, no, no. I need shillings. We're back and forth, back and forth. My wife got to go to the restroom. Finally, I say, ma'am, I don't have any shillings. My wife has to go take a shilling. Please let her go in there. <laughs> Just so happened, our host comes up. He talks to her. He reaches in his pocket. Guess what he pulled out, Miss Bernice? He pulled out some shillings. Because I had not yet gone to the money changers and exchanged my money. I'm in a different country. I'm in a different country. If I want to buy and sell, I got to use their currency. Listen, it's they gym. They rules. Am I right about it? Amen. Same thing here in the text. So if you are a Jew and you're coming from another country, another region, you have another currency, when you get there, if you want to buy a sacrifice to offer it in the temple, if you want to give an offering in the offering plate, you have to use the currency they have. So that's why money changes were in place. So you come and you give me your money and there is not an even exchange because we got to have a handling fee, right? Service charges. And guess what? We set the rates. And if you look like you got a little money, like you might got a little scratch, maybe these rates are flexible. And so what happened was there were exorbitant rates being charged. It was a game. It was a con. And it was so much a game or a con, they were in cahoots with each other. Because get this, you show up from another country, you want to buy a sacrifice to offer it in the temple so that your sins could be forgiven. I came here to get right with God. So because I came here to get right with God, and guess what? This is the only God there is. This is the only house he got. There's a monopoly. I can't go nowhere else. So I show up, I need to buy a sacrifice. I go over, hey, you got sacrifice to sell? Yes, I do. How much? Is this much? I pull out my money. I don't take that. Well, what do you take? You got to go over there and exchange your money. So I take my money over here. They're ripping me off because they in cahoots. Oh, 
It ain't one for one. And so now they're getting me there. Now I get the money. I get the exchange from the money changes. I go to buy my sacrifice according to the law. What I give to God has got to be good. It's got to be without spot or blemish. I can't give God nothing diseased and frail and sick. I've got to give God the best. But if all you got to sell me is something that's sick and diseased, you keep the best for your folk. But I'm a foreigner, so I got to get what's left. I came here to get right with God. So you got me over a barrel. It's a monopoly. It's a game. So you cheat me over here with the exchange. You cheat me with the sacrifice. And where am I going to go? This became how they built the temple economy. On top of that, priests, scribes, Pharisees, they charged what's called temple tax. All of this, it became a racket. It became a game. It became a business. It was nothing more than extorting people who were vulnerable. So when Jesus comes to the temple, the first thing he does, he goes to the table of the money changes. He didn't go to where they were singing, preaching, or praying, if they even did it. He goes to the money changes table, and he turns it over. Can I show y'all what, what I learned and what I believe to be true? And I got some Bible to back me up on this. I believe that Jesus is going in because he is fighting against idolatry. Because money and mammon had become a god to them. And so the first thing he does, he walks into the house of God and he overthrows their god of money. Let me show you a few things. Go to, um, go to Matthew chapter 6 verse 24. Matthew 6 verse 24. We're hanging out with Matthew a little bit today. Matthew chapter 6 verse 24. Jesus says this earlier. He says, no one can serve two masters. He will hate the one and love the other, or he'll be devoted to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve God and mammon. What's mammon? Mammon is material wealth, money, possessions. It says you can't serve both. Listen, money is a good servant, but it's a terrible master. You, you can't serve it. And so to say that you love God and you love money is incorrect. You can't love both. Jesus said, and you cannot serve both. And money, mammon, Wealth, possessions had become their God. Truth of the matter is, it's become ours in this society as well. Oh, folk love money. Folk love money. Some people really need it. Some people got to have it. Some people do things, bad things. <laughs> Don't act like y'all don't know about the OJs and love money. Come on, don't act like y'all don't know the OJs. Boy, I can't stand when y'all act too sanctified. Make me feel like the biggest sinner in Griffin. So, so I'm the only one that know the OJs. Okay, 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 okay. Okay, all right. Here's the thing. Um, when you look at his first act of entering the temple, and you think, well, maybe it's a coincidence. I'm going to tell you something. I, I saw this, I saw this, I saw this preparing for this lesson, and it was like a light switch came on for me. Is that when Jesus comes in, he deals with the idolatry in his father's house. The idolatry is mammon. They trusted mammon more than the master. Go to the book of Exodus chapter 20. Exodus chapter 20. We're going to hang out in the Old Testament for a minute. And it's going to become clearer and clearer and clearer. 
And listen, when it becomes clearer, when you understand what I'm really saying, I need somebody to just shout Eureka. I found it. I see it. I'm serious. Y'all make me feel like a Bible nerd. Like I'm the only one to get happy about this stuff. Exodus chapter 20. So Exodus chapter 20. Let me um, share this with you. Exodus chapter 20. So Exodus chapter 20 is famous. And you may not know why it's famous, but I'm going to share with you why it's famous. In Exodus chapter 20. There is something that's famous. It's called the Decalogue. The Decalogue. Raise your hand if you've never heard of the Decalogue. Thank y'all. Boy, I love y'all. Thank y'all. Thank y'all. Thank y'all. I got all these scholars on this side. All the scholars on this side. The Decalogue. Okay. Let me ask you if you ever heard of this. Those who lifted your hands, have you ever heard of the Ten Commandments? That's what the Decalogue is. So now you can sound real spiritual and intelligent. <laughs> so so when, I, when I throw it out there, that'll be like our little sign to each other when I'm preaching. Uh, the Decalogue. That's right, Pastor, the Ten Commandments. <laughs> the word Deca means ten. Log is the law or commandment. The Decalogue is the Ten Commandments. We're not going to read them all. We're going to read the foundation for them. Because the foundation for the Ten Commandments speaks to this thing called idolatry. B before you can even attempt to keep the Ten Commandments, before I can even attempt to keep them, and by the way, we can't, but before we even attempt to keep them, God sets this as a foundation. He must be first. He will suffer no rivals. Like Prince said, you need another lover like you need a hole in your head. He must be the one and only. He will not have any rivals for his affection. So before he gives the Ten Commandments, he lays the foundation that he must be first. Verse 1, chapter 20. Then God spoke all these words saying... I am the Lord your God who brought you out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of slavery. You shall have no other gods before me. You shall not make for yourself an idol or any likeness of what is in heaven above or the earth beneath or in the water under the earth. You shall not worship them or serve them for I, the Lord your God, am a jealous God visiting the iniquity of the fathers on the children on the third and fourth generations of those who hate me. He says in verse 5, he's jealous. I don't want you up in another man's face. Don't you be on another God's face. He says, I'm your God. I delivered you out the house of slavery. I brought you out of bondage. I opened red seas for you. I dare you sit there going to fix another man's plate and I'm sitting here. You ain't said nothing to me. I'm sitting here parched, and you asking the pastor, you want some lemonade, pastor? <laughs> I wish you would. Do it, key, key, key in that man's face. I pay the bills here. I keep the roof over your head. I keep you safe. It's like a husband talking to his wife. That's the relationship. God says, I got to be first. If I'm not first, you're not even going to come close to keeping these commandments. Anything you worship other than God is idolatry. Anybody you worship other than God, you've made an idol. And God requires that he be first. And this is the truth. We live in a day of idolatry. And you might be thinking, no, we don't. We don't bow down and worship little stone creatures. And we don't worship things made out of wood or gold or silver. But you know what? We have idols that we walk around in our hands. Let me see that. These little things have become our idols. We'll keep our face in this stuff all day long. 
We give our time, our attention, our affection. You fool around and leave the house and left your phone at home. You'll be like a junkie tweaking. There are things that we have made idols in our life. When it gets more of your time, your attention, your affection, and your resources and money than God does, you've made that your idol. And the same thing that was true in that day is true in this day. God requires that he be first. No other God before me. No other God before me. Are y'all with me? So now we're about to go to the book of 1 Samuel. And we're about to see how God deals with idols. Who want to see how God deals with idols? You want to see how God deals with idols? Y'all ain't excited enough for me. You got a question? Yes, sir. Yes. Where they are their own idol. Yes. It's called narcissism. It's called narcissism. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Listen. Lucifer. The sin of pride. Narcissism. He became his own God. He made the declaration in his heart that he would exalt his throne above the throne of the Most High. He no longer wanted to render worship. He wanted to be worshipped. So, yes, one can make themselves an idol without a doubt. Without a doubt. That they become their own God. Listen to the language of the day when people say, well, that's my truth. What are you talking about? There are no individual truths. It's true or it's not. Just like there are no alternative facts. But notice the language of the day. Alternative facts, my truth. No, that's your opinion. That's your opinion. That's not a truth. But people have come in and they've co-opted words. They've commandeered, they've kidnapped words, and they've tried to make a thing mean what it don't mean. So we're going to see how God deals with idols. Number one, he says, don't have none. Don't have none. Don't have none, right? He said, you mine. Don't have none. Don't be key key in no other God face. <laughs> we're going to see how God deals with idols. Go to the book of 1 Samuel. Samuel chapter 5. I'm sorry, 1 Samuel chapter 5. So let me give you the, um, the background for 1 Samuel 5. Um, during this time in Israel's history, they did not have a king. They were ruled by judges. Judges, um, they, were, they were the civil authority in the land. At this time, the judge that ruled in Israel was a man named Eli. Eli was a judge, but he was also the high priest. He, he had a civil office as a judge, but he also had a spiritual office as a high priest. The high priest is the holiest man in Israel. That's his job. That's his function. Uh, he's the nation's pastor. He offers the sacrifices on the Day of Atonement. It's the job of the high priest to go behind the veil once a year and offer the sacrifices for the people of God. It's a very exalted and high position. And the priesthood, the priesthood was prone to nepotism. What that means is you have to be born in the right family to be a priest. You couldn't just wake up one day and say, you know what, I've been called to be a priest. No, you're lying. <laughs> no, because you had to be of a certain tribe. It's called the tribe of Levi. Specifically, you've got to be a direct descendant of Aaron the brother of Moses. That's how the priesthood ran. The high priest, Eli, at this time, he is in charge. And like any father, he wants to leave the family business to his sons. Problem is, he's got two sons, one named Hophni and the other one, Phinehas, and they weren't worth two dead flies. Oh, they was trifling. Oh, they were some no good brothers. 
Oh, they stole money. They messed with women. They was horrible. But they were his sons. Eli, for the most part, was a good man. But he was a weak leader. The reason he was a weak leader is because he knew his sons were wretched and he would not correct them. He knew they were out of pocket. And he never, ever held them accountable. As a result, the nation suffers because them his boys. Eli's gotten old. He can't do what he used to do. He's about 98 years old. His eyes are getting dim. He can barely see if at all. Hoffna and Fennihoss, they're pretty much, for all practical purposes, running the show now. And Israel goes into battle against their arch enemy, named the Philistines. And whenever they would have a battle or a war and they wanted to ensure their victory, you know what they would do, Miss Amanda? They would get something called the Ark of the Covenant. The Ark of the Covenant that Moses made. And in the Ark of the Covenant that was made out of gopher wood, it was overlaid by gold. Inside the Ark, you had a pot of manna, you had Aaron's rod that budded almonds, and you had the Ten Commandments. And they believed that this ark that was made out of gopher wood, overlaid by gold, on the top of it, they had a sculpture of two seraphim. Those are winged angels. And they had their heads bowed toward each other. The tips of their wings would touch. And in the middle, there was something called the mercy seat. They believe God's presence dwells with the ark. So if we got the ark, we got God. And if we got God, you know what, Kiki, we can't lose. So when they wanted to ensure victory, they would take the ark of the covenant with them in battle. Think about it, Dex. You got God backing you up. Boy, you'll slap Mike Tyson. But here's the thing. You can't handle the holy things of God with dirty hands and expect a good outcome. Hophni and Phinehas, they were in charge of the ark. And so here these vile, wretched men take the ark of the covenant with the army into battle against the Philistines. They had really lost a reverence for the ark because they really reverenced the ark. They knew they were too vile to touch it. You know what it had become? This holy artifact had become a rabbit's foot. A four-leaf clover, an instrument of superstition. That's all it had become to them. So they go into the battle against the Philistines. They've got the Ark of the Covenant. And wonder of wonders, they lose the battle. But even worse, they lose the Ark. You know what else they lose? They lose Hophni and Phinehas. They're both killed in battle. Somebody may have said, well, good riddance to bad rubbish. Word gets back to Ebenezer. Ebenezer is where Eli was. That was the capital at that time. And Eli is sitting. He's sitting outside the city gate waiting to hear news of the battle. He's sitting in his chair. That's where the leader would sit. And he's waiting to hear news from the battle. And a messenger comes running on foot, tired, exhausted, out of breath. Eli, the scripture says, could, could not really see, so he's squinting. And he's listening. Son, what happened? Tell me. And the messenger tells him. Father, we lost. Not only did we lose the battle, but we lost, we lost Hophni and Phinehas, his two sons. Not only did we lose the battle, not only did we lose Hophni and Phinehas, but we lost the Ark of the Covenant. And when he gave him that bit of news, Eli falls back off of his chair and breaks his neck. A broken heart leads to a broken neck and he dies right there in the dirt. Same messenger takes word inside the city gates and they go to the house 
where Hophni and Phinehas' wife is. And Phinehas, his wife was pregnant. She's about to be full term, and she wants to hear about her husband. Is he alive? Did he make it? Did Israel win the battle? We lost the battle. We lost your husband. We lost his brother. And we lost the Ark of the Covenant. Right then, labor pains ran through her body. Her water broke. And she gave birth to a child right there on the spot. When she heard they have lost their God. She was so distraught. The loss of her husband is one thing, but you lost the ark. She's so distraught. You've heard of postpartum depression? She's so distraught when she has the baby and a boy baby at that. She don't even want to look at the baby. You, you've got a baby boy. What do we name him? I don't care what you name him. Name him Ichabod. The name Ichabod, you know what it means? It means the glory of the Lord has departed. The glory is gone. Imagine going around your whole life named Ichabod. That's what Israel is going through in Ebenezer. For the first time in their history, the ark is not in their possession, but in the possession of the enemies. So now the Philistines... They take the ark to their capital city, a place called Ashdod. And they didn't worship Jehovah. They didn't worship Yahweh. They didn't worship our God, the God of the Hebrews and all. They, they were idolaters. One of many they worshiped was a God, a false God named Dagon. Dagon crafted out of stone, strong and built and muscular. And so they take the Ark of the Covenant into the temple of Dagon. So you have on this side the God of the Philistines. And in this corner, the God of the Hebrews. And they put them in the same temple. Reggie, they close the door and they go to bed. What we're going to read is what they see the next morning. Chapter 5, verse 1. You there? After the Philistines had captured the ark of God, they took him from Ebenezer to Ashdod, carried it into the temple of Dagon, and set it beside his statue. When the people of Ashdod got up early the next morning, there was Dagon fallen on his face before the ark of the Lord. So they took Dagon and returned him to his place. Stop right there. Over here, the Ark of the Covenant. Over here, we got Dagon. Two gods in one temple. They leave, come back the next morning, and what do they find? They find Dagon prostrate on the ground, bowed before the God of the Hebrews. They got to figure out what happened. Maybe, maybe Dagon tripped, but he got legs, but he can't walk. He couldn't have tripped. Maybe, maybe a strong wind came in and blew him off, but he's so heavy and he's so big. It couldn't have been a wind, but I, I don't know. Maybe it's just a fluke. Maybe it's something we'll never know. We can't explain. Maybe it's an anomaly. So what should we do? Because it can't really mean nothing. So what do they do? They pick him up. Let me tell you something. I wouldn't have a God I had to pick up. I need a God meant that'll pick me up when I fall down. If you got to pick your God up when he fall down, I got news for you. You got the wrong God. Can, can we read what happened next? Let's read what happened next. Y'all don't get excited enough for me. But when they got up early the next morning, there was a day gone, falling on his face before the ark of the Lord. Huh. So they return, stop there. Come on, don't, don't go too fast now. I see you reading, you hold up. <laughs> so they put Dagon in his place. They, they pick, all these men get together, pick him up, ropes and leverage, and everything. They, they get him back. And you know, and I, I'm just going to take a little creative liberty. What they probably did, what they probably did, they probably said, to make sure this don't happen. There you go. Yo, yeah, you thinking like I'm thinking. 
tie him down, put some straps over his feet, bolt him to the floor. We're going to make sure this don't happen no more. First time was a fluke. Maybe a strong gust of wind came in. It's just a gathering. I don't know, but we're going to make sure this don't happen no more. So they come back the next day. And what do they find? They find him falling on his face before the ark of the Lord, comma. We pause for effect. And he goes on, with his head and his hands broken off at the threshold. With his head and his hand cut off. So the next day they show up, not only is Dagon prostrate before the God of the Hebrews, but his head and his hands. Hands is where you got power. Your head, where you have wisdom and reasoning. When they show up, what God tells them, not only does your God bow before me, your God is not a God. He has no power, he has no wisdom, and he has no reasoning. And he is laying there on the ground before the Ark of the Covenant. His hands and his head are right there at the threshold. And the Philistines to this, well, as long as they were in existence, would never step on that spot again because that's where the head and hands of their God were. But if you think that was it, that was a fluke too. Maybe it was a fluke. God does something else supernatural that affects. Oh, good, I got one minute left. Can I give me a little, just give me a little grace. This is what God does next to show his displeasure. Unholy hands handling holy things. He begins to affect the people. He gives them, I'm going to see if y'all know what this is. Look at uh, verse is it six? Yeah, there it is. He begins, it says, now the hand of the Lord was heavy on the people of Ashdod and his vicinity, ravaging them and afflicting them with tumors. That's, that's one translation. It, it wasn't tumors in the sense of what we think, like tumors in but He afflicted them with piles. Somebody know what piles is? Huh? Hemorrhoids. Hemorrhoids. Can you imagine the whole city? <laughs> None of them sit down. The whole city, everybody running hot water. <laughs> Line stretched down the street at CVS. <laughs> you got in the preparation agent. <laughs> Struck them with him, Roy. God messed them up so bad, you know what they did? They gave the ark back to them and with some money. <laughs> all right, so I went through all of that to paint this picture. One temple, two gods. God shows what he does when another god is in his presence. He overturns it. You getting it now? Now. Back. We ain't got time to fool with Mark. We'll go, go right back to Matthew because that's where we were. You have to get with Mark on the flip side. So now when you read it, it's going to make more sense. Chapter 12. So my claim, my statement about this being about idolatry, it becomes clear to you now, doesn't it? 12, verse 12, chapter 21, and Jesus entered the temple and drove out all those who were buying and selling in the temple and overturned the tables of the money changers. Overturn, turn them over just like he did in the old covenant by turning over the idol god Dagon. Because when you have another god in the house of our god, that other god is an idol. And remember Exodus 20, the Decalogue, our god is a jealous god. And so Jesus is almost as if he said, I can't go to heaven to see my daddy until I go to the temple and clean it out. I got to go to his house. He had already claimed this was his daddy's house at the age of 12 when they thought he was lost. He said, what you mean? Where I been? I've been about my father's business. He goes back to his father's house 
into the temple and he sees two gods. My dad is here and your other god, Mammon, is here. Both of them can't stand. You ever heard the term, can't have too many grown folk in the same house? One got to bow. He turns over the money table. Can I give y'all a secret? Don't tell nobody. Y'all promise to keep the secret? Okay. So this is something the pastors say. Okay? So if you, if you, if you, if you repeat this to a pastor, I'm going to get in trouble. Now they're going to come at me, so... Y'all can't tell them that. This is, pre, this is like G14 clearance stuff I'm telling y'all, okay? But this is something the pastor said. The last thing to get saved on a believer is their wallet and their pocketbook. It's the last thing to get saved. What does that mean? That means folk will come to the Lord and they'll say, Lord, I give you my life. I was a cusser, but I'm giving you my tongue. I'm a with your help, I'm going to stop cussing so much. Matter of fact, I'm a, when, even when it come out by accident, I, Lord, forgive me. I'm going to consecrate my tongue. Lord, I, I'm going to give you my eyes. I'm going to stop looking at them websites, and I'm going to stop looking at the stuff I know is displeasing to you. You know what? Lord, I'm, I'm, I'm going to stop getting drunk. I, I'm, I'm going to stop getting inebriated, getting out of my mind. I'm going to present my body a living sacrifice. But when it comes to my wallet and my pocketbook, now that, that's, that's my business. That's, that's, that's I, I mean, I can't, now dime out every dollar. You know how much money that is? I worked overtime last week. Do you know how much money that is? He, of course he does. But here's the thing. If we're honest, in our heart, many of us, we worship mammon over the master because it's so hard for us to part with the mammon. When God and his word commands us to give, we, we think of every reason why. We can't, I can't, my bills, I can't this. And I don't know, if I do that, I don't know what's going to happen. And every time we are disobedient, we're choosing mammon over the master. So who is really your God? Let's be honest. Is mammon or the master? Who, who really are you putting your trust in? And when we look at the Old Testament, he shows us, God shows us time and time and time and time again. He's trying to get us to trust him, not material things. Trust him, not the mammon, but trust the master. I'll give you another quick illustration. In the wilderness for 40 years, God commanded Israel. When I send manna every day, only take enough for one day. Take an, if you take more than that, it's going to spoil. It's not going to do you no good. Why would he do that? Because he's teaching them to trust him as their source. He's teaching, trust the master over the manna. Manna is what they make bread with. Bread is what we call money. Trust me over your bread. Trust me over your money. But, Lord, if I bring it, if I give it, I mean, I don't know what I'm going to do. No, that's called faith. Know that I will provide for your needs. I will open up windows of heaven. You won't have room enough to receive. Because here's the thing. Many of us have been duped and the fooled into thinking that when you come to church, the church is trying to get something from you, especially that old chicken eating preacher. Trying to get something from you. And don't let the preacher, listen, have some nice clothes and a nice car. Listen, oh, he just fleecing the flock. Listen, you, you don't say when your favorite rapper, when whoever did it, whoever they got what they got, oh, they earned it, they ballers. <laughs> Not did he? Oh, he done got in trouble or something? Okay, well, y'all got hit me after. Y'all got to hit me afterwards. Okay, listen, listen. I, listen, I got to catch up on some of that stuff. I got that's what my nieces and nephews keep me in the loop. <laughs> huh? He on the run? Oh Lord, that's a whole other Bible study. Okay. <laughs> but but here's my point. Here's my point. That the world system, and has completely duped us into thinking that 
You can, you can trust your money, but you can't trust God. You can't trust the church. So I'll let God before I let go of my money. I'll let go of the church before I let go of my money. Because that's what my trust is. And this is what the scripture says, where your treasure is, where your heart is. Are y'all hearing me? So when Jesus comes into Jerusalem, you think, well, he was just mad and angry with them. He was. It was, they were cheating folk. It was more about idolatry than anything else. He is reestablishing order in the house of God. I'm going to say this, and I know I'm way over time, but that's why you have so much compromise in the pulpit. You know why? Because if you preach or teach against the wrong demographic and group, I, I, listen, they're going to hang. Uh, okay, I'm going to just say it. Gay folk give better than y'all do. And they vote too. Don't get quiet on me. The LGBTQI, whatever. Listen, the alphabet community, they put their money where their mouth is. That's why in a shorter span of time, they've made more political headway than black folk who've been in this country since its inception. Because they galvanize their resources, they put their money where their mouth is. I'm going to prove it to you. You ain't got to believe me. When President Obama, and check it out, Google it, Google your friend. When President Obama, his first election, they asked him how he felt about same-sex marriage. He was against it. He said, I'll give them civil unions, but not, and I'm not anti-gay. Listen, I, civil unions, yeah, but not marriage. No, that's sacred, no. After that first election, he gets four years in. Black folk just so happy he got in there. We forgot. We ain't voting. We ain't giving. We ain't doing nothing. Listen, it's getting hard on the yard. He needs campaign funds, and he needs political clout. We still over there just, just as happy as some freshly freed slaves. <laughs> the alphabet community comes to him and says, you can read the tea leaves. If you want a second term, we need you to do some things. We need you to acknowledge that we have the right to be married just like everybody else. He did an about face. I voted for him twice, but I'm going to tell the truth. He did an about face. We thought you didn't believe in same-sex marriage. Well, when I'm at home reading the Bible, it's clear. But when I see same gender loving people and they are just, all of a sudden his rhetoric, his position changed. And it became the law of the land. Why? Because black folk in the church didn't support him. He never promised he was a prophet. He's a politician. When he looked at you, he see a vote. Are you hearing me? That's why he compromised. He's a politician. Why is there so much compromise in the pulpit? The same reason it was in that day, money. Because if you make folk in your church who have a good giving block, you make them mad, they leave. Now you change your whole message to cater to your audience. Preachers, what do I tell you about the audience? I ain't going to say it. What do I tell you about the audience in your sermon? What? You better say it. Say it louder. Your audience always affects your application. You got to know who you preaching to. And you preach to who you preaching to. So if I'm preaching to folk, and I need what they got. And I ain't saying what they want to hear. They're going to leave and I'm without a job. So what do I do? My audience determines my application. And if you are not a man of integrity, you will compromise God's truth. Because you don't want to lose your nickels and your coins, your position and your job. Are y'all hearing me? I can prove it. Man comes in the pastor's study. This is the day we live in. And we can do a list of churches. Man comes in the pastor's study. He tells the pastor that he's having these feelings for somebody of the same gender. That, that, that he's just, and he's been that way since he was a little boy. He was born that way. 
It's a horrible way to live. He's saved, he says. He loves God, he says. But he's gay. And so he likes being at that church. But some of the things you say are just hateful and intolerant. And me, and there's some others here, I can't expose them, but we've been talking. And they give by 34% of the budget. We're not going to be able to stay because we don't feel comfortable here. Pastor said, wait, wait a minute, wait a minute. You say you've been having these feelings your whole life? I have. You say you were born this way? Yeah. Well, just embrace it. We're here to love, not to judge. God will work it out. And that philosophy has proliferated through the church that we turned a blind eye to sin. And again, I'm not homophobic or anti-gay, but let me show you the hypocrisy. After that appointment is over, another man comes in. He's heterosexual. He says, Pastor, I'm having these urges and desires. And it's for deacon such and such's wife. Every time I see her, I get a fever. The girl got legs so pretty, she put stockings out of business. Woo! Pastor, I want her bad. The pastor going to say, what? What is wrong with you, brother? That's adultery. In the Decalogue, see, I hooked that up. Exodus 20, thou shalt not commit adultery. That's covetousness in the, y'all so slow. In the Decalogue, thou shalt not covet. Thy neighbor, thy neighbor's wife, thy neighbor's maidservant, maid ser nothing. Brother, you're wrong. Cast down that thought. Repent. Pray. Stay away from her. Defriend her on Facebook. Quit following her on Instagram. Brother, that's wrong. Wait a minute. What's the difference? You're telling the first one to embrace it. You're telling the other one to repent and reject it. Sin is sin. But the influence has such a stronghold in the church. And you say, how did that happen? It happened in that day. And it's happening today. And that's a form of idolatry. Listen, you can make your sexuality idolatry. When they have their parades, they ain't nothing but a form of their worship. March down Main Street. Just as bold and proud as you please. And got the nerve to lie on God. He, made, he ain't made you that way. Sexuality is a choice. It's a choice. Now here's the thing. We have urges, desires, and proclivities. You like what you like, but what you do is what you choose. Are you hearing me? And so just because I'm heterosexual, I like women, I can't step out on my wife and say, well, baby, I was just born this way. So you got to excuse me. I was just born liking women. So I get a pass. I show up Sunday looking like a harpo. Type of what, what happened to you, Pastor? I, the mule kicked me, y'all. <laughs> Are y'all hearing me? Okay, I see hands going up. Okay, you first, Mike, then you, Robert. I don't think it's money. I think more than anything, it's influence and clout. Because politicians don't come to give money, they come to get it. But it's a stroke to a pastor's ego if a politician comes and he says, hey, can I have five minutes, 10 minutes, 20 minutes to talk to your congregation? So my standard policy on politicians is this. When a politician comes, I'll acknowledge you, um, but I'm not going to give you a platform in the pulpit to propagate whatever your stance is. Now, if I believe you to be a credible person, I ain't got a problem saying that. I ain't got a problem saying that. Now, 
we got to be careful even how we say that because we're a nonprofit organization. So we don't want to put the church on a, any undue scrutiny. And I don't want to do anything that's going to make the church come under a microscope. So I, I know how to work that. However, when a politician comes, and you're right, there are certain preachers that will yield their pulpit for a politician to do his stump speech. Here's the issue, and, here, and here's where you open yourself up. If you do it, let's say, for the Democratic nominee, if the Republican nominee comes, and he says, you gave him 27 minutes to give his stump speech, I need 27 minutes next Sunday for mine. If you don't, now you've put yourself in a precarious position where that church can be responsible, you're liable, your nonprofit status can be in jeopardy, because now, if you did it for the left, you got to do it for the right. If you're going to play, you got to play fair. Do you see what I'm saying? And say so it becomes more a thing about ego. We've, we have politicians that are coming here, and they come in here, why? Because they'll see the parking lot, and they see the folks, and folks say what they say in the community, whatever it is, so they think this might be a place to come, and I like not stand up, wave your hand. If you want to talk to them, talk to them after service, you know? Um, but you're not going to get in the pulpit and give your stump speech. That ain't happened in 20 years. And I don't see it happening tomorrow. Yeah. Right. Yeah. It's a status thing. It's definitely a status thing. The governor comes to your church. Wow, the governor was over there at the start. And if the governor ain't safe, he's going to hell too. <laughs> Robert, you had something? Oh, Lord, we'll be here all night. <laughs> Now you make allowances and excuses for it. So here's the thing, and here's the hypocrisy in that statement, and how if a person is gay, it's degrading to them. You're equating homosexuality and sexual preference to a disease. That if you're saying if they're born cerebral palsy, they can be born gay. If they're born with whatever the disease. So you're saying that your sexuality is a disease. That's If you are gay, I would think that would be insulting. No, yeah, but, but here, here's also the thing that we have to be careful of, and it's also a form of idolatry. We do not have the prerogative or the power to define what sin is. That's what we've got to be clear about. Sin, God has defined what sin is. God has defined what righteousness is. God has defined what right is, and God has defined what wrong is. And we don't have the power or the authority to redefine what God has already defined in his word. And to say that you're going to redefine what God has already defined, then you're putting yourself on a higher platform than God. God has defined marriage, male and female, husband and wife. It's clear in scripture. We can go there if we got time. But when you come back and you redefine and say, well, no, it's just two consenting adults. So now you have taken your eraser and erased what God says that is wrong. I got a better idea than God. 
That's prideful. That's arrogant. That's narcissistic. That's idolatry. We cannot redefine what God has already defined. God invented marriage. How are you going to sit there and try to tell Alexander Graham Bell how to build a phone? How are you going to tell Henry Ford how to build a Model T? No. And when you make a thing, you've got the prerogative to name a thing. Who in here got children? Raise your hand. You name yours, you name yours, you name yours? Yeah, because you made them. So you named them. This thing called marriage, this thing even called gender. God named them, male and female, only two. Google how many genders there are. There are more genders listed than you got toes or fingers. How are you going to rename what God has named, redefine what God has, def has defined? If that's not narcissistic, prideful, and idolatry, I don't know what it is. Right. Right. And and how and how complicit do I have to be in your delusion? How I can look at you and tell that you're one gender, but you're requiring I call you another. I see you're a singular person, but you're telling me to call you they and them. So now I'm compelled to be complicit in your self delusion. Where they do that at? All right, y'all, I done gone 24, 24 minutes over time. Okay. Listen. <laughs> Listen. And I ain't giving no change back. Don't come back next week talking about we got a short Bible study because you went over. Uh-uh, this your all fault. This your all fault. It's your all fault. Come on, let's stand. Let's stand. Um, well, baby, you was right. We didn't get through. Uh, we, we, didn't, we, we didn't get through Holy Week. I listen, I brought my little chart out. Listen, I had my little chart out. I just knew we're going to get through Monday, Thursday, and, and I, we ain't going to get through none of that. So come back Friday. Please don't forget uh, this Friday is Good Friday service, uh, unlike anything we've ever done here at Rising Star. And that's not hyperbole, that it is a completely different worship experience. And so be praying um, that, that it will be a meaningful experience. And I, I truly believe it will be. Um, we're wearing black. You don't have to wear black, but we are wearing black. You come, the choir's going to be in black. Clergy's going to be in black. If you got paint, come on anyway. Don't matter. But um, it will be a time of remembering, reflecting, reverencing, and worship. It's the best way I know how to say it. Uh, you want to be here. You want to be here. I believe it's going to strengthen you. You want to be here. That's on Friday. On Sunday, we have two services, 6.30 a.m., at Archaea Baptist Church. Uh, our choir is singing, I'll be preaching. And then uh, we're gonna come back and they're gonna serve us breakfast afterwards. And then we're gonna come back here to our sanctuary at 10 a.m. for our scheduled worship service at 10 a.m. Um, because of uh, my wife and your first lady, I got a whole bunch of studying to do for preaching on Sunday. I see, if, it, if it had my rathers, whatever I preach at Archaea, I was gonna preach that. But she is such a, a, a sermon and preach snob. Oh, she is just, y'all just don't know. Listen, let me tell you something. If I'm going somewhere to preach, she said, what you preaching? So I tell her, she'll say, mm. I, heard, I heard that at Rising Star. I was hoping for something new and fresh. I said, it's new and fresh for them. They ain't never heard it. It was worth preaching once. It was worth preaching twice. But I was just... I figured you the preacher. You didn't talk to the Lord. He didn't give you. Oh, my goodness. I got to write a whole nother sermon. So, so it, it'll be a different message. <laughs> Amen. Amen. So, um, but, but we are looking forward. It, it is going to be a great, great weekend. 
And this is just for kicks and giggles. You ain't got to come to this if you got something going on. But um, on Friday, there'll be a noon service in Jonesboro, Calvary Baptist Church. They're having a good Friday service up there. Uh, I'm preaching it. And um, I'm not, you know, asking you to go because we got a long weekend. We got multiple services. But I'm just letting you know. And so if you want to go, just see Lady Dove. She can give you. Uh, the details, but it's at Calvary Baptist Church at 12 o'clock, and they are going to have a fish fry afterwards, so if you come, I'll buy you lunch. <laughs> um, we want to keep Minister Ernestine McQuarrie in prayer. She had surgery last week, but she's recovering well. She's doing good at home, and she'll be back with us soon. Uh, amen? Amen. Amen. If you don't mind, come on up, Reggie, and close in prayer. All right. Let us pray. In the powerful name of Jesus, Lord, we just thank you, God. Lord, we thank you for this word on today, God. Lord, we thank you for this week. So, Lord, we just ask that you just continue to guide and lead us, Lord. Continue to strengthen us, Lord. Continue to show us what you need us to do, Lord. And, Lord, right now we're just praying for Minister McQuarrie right now, God, and her, for her to get stronger, God, and to come right back like she was, Lord. So, Lord, right now we also ask that you just protect us as we leave this place, God. Protect every family, God. Shield them from any harm, hurt, or danger, God. And, Lord, we just thank you and we honor you, Lord. We can't say it enough, God, how much we thank you, God, and how much you do for us, God, and that we are so undeserving of it, God. But, Lord, just make us better, God. Lord, we here now to be better, God. So, Lord, we just lift our hands to you, and we know that you're going to take us all the way. And so it is in a powerful name your people have prayed. Amen, amen, amen. Thank you for your yes, appreciate it, sir.